Hey there, my name is Jack Droppers. I am the director of the Student Activities Office here at Calvin University. We have a bit of an atypical video for you tonight. Um, I'm going to be sitting down with two folks that are incredible in their fields and uh, new friends of mine. The first is a professor of philosophy, Jamie Smith, here at Calvin, whose new book is called On the Road with St. Augustine. Um, and the second is a theologian in his own right, but also the bassist for the band Delta Spirit, John Jameson. Uh, Delta Spirit's new record is called What Is There, and it is out now on New West Records. So let's welcome Jamie and John. All right, welcome to the show, both of you. It's great to be here. Um, Good I'll, to be here. I'll talk a little bit about what uh, preceded me emailing the two of you and saying, uh, we should all get together. Um, so I was flipping through uh, John's Instagram this summer and saw that he was reading on the road at the same time that I was. And I, I put it out there to my 73 Twitter followers. Is it awkward for me to like Instagram the basis for a band I really love and say, hey, let's talk about this book together. <laughs> and most of them agreed that it probably was not appropriate to do so. Um, but then I said, what if I brought in the author of the book and that changes the scenario? Um, so here we are. Great, yeah, good job. <laughs> I'm glad you did it, yeah. Um, so uh, John, first question for you, knowing uh, that you've read this and I'm assuming read other pieces of Jamie's writing, I'm curious, uh, thinking about Delta Spirit concerts and as experiences of, of liturgy, of cultural liturgy, does that change the way that you perceive your own performance at a live show? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've, I've been thinking a lot about this lately, largely because uh, my band uh, went on our first tour in about five years in March. And the last, uh, the first show of the tour was in San Francisco. Um, and the next day was kind of when the world started to shut down because of coronavirus. And so it, I, it was already kind of impending. We knew something was coming. And so as I was on stage that night, like I, I knew, I, I had the sense like, this could be the last time I'm, I'm playing in front of people, like playing these songs with people in a really long time. Um, which is kind of a strange thing because it was also the first time that I was playing <laughs> these songs with people uh, in, in a really long time, um, and so and so I tried to you know not not normally am I that like introspective while I'm on stage necessarily, but I was I was really kind of trying to soak in you know what that meant, and then at the same point like I uh, I was at church at, you know at at uh, you know a Eucharist the Sunday before, and I was also thinking the same thing. I was thinking. I'm at church with people, and this might be the last time this is going to happen for a little while. This might be the last time I receive the Eucharist. This might be the last time I'm worshiping with other people. Um, and like, I definitely didn't imagine that it was going to be as long or you know as intense as it's been. But um, but yeah, I could tell something was 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 you know was shifting there. And so so eventually, it's you know I've been through different phases, you know stages of grief in this process. <laughs> uh, but like. But I have thought a lot about what it means. Like, what is what makes what makes playing in front of people different than just me playing in my room? Um, what in the same way, like with church, like what makes like going to church different than meeting up online or something like that? And so, so I mean, I think the big things uh, it, that are different is that, that there's physical presence and there's a certain level of participation, even in the, even in the crowd at a concert, like. It's it's not just people kind of standing far off and watching something happen. There's definitely an, like a, a, a participation that the crowd is is a part of as well. And so and I feel that same way about the worship experience at church. It's it's not just that the priest really far away is doing something, but there's this there's this corporate participation. And I realize eventually that's that's what I'm really missing, uh, both in music and uh, in you know in my in my worshiping ecclesial life as well. Mm -hmm. I, that's so resonant. I, I, I think live concerts is what I miss most in yeah. Corona time. Yeah. I, I guess I'm supposed to say church is what I miss most, but, <laughs> I, but, to be, but I mean, we, we, it's interesting. Our church experience has been 
shifted to a different kind of community interaction, mm. I think, which has been yeah. interesting in itself. But when I, if I just think about, like I miss travel, I, there's a lot of things I miss, but I, what I miss most has been live concerts. Mm -hmm. And it's so true that, uh, um, you know, like every time you go to a national concert, it is going to end with Vanderlyle, Lyle, cry baby, cry, <laughs> you know, and the whole <laughs> crowd is participating and it's call and response. Mm -hmm. And and when yeah. you go to the Aver Brothers, it's gonna be I and love yep. and you and the whole audience is there. And it's a deeply incarnate and communal yeah. and corp, like you said, it's, it's a corporate action that is mm -hmm. never even close to me singing back at you in my car mm. as I'm listening <laughs> to Delta Spirit. You know? Right, so it's, right, yeah. There's, yeah. It, it, it just tells us both of them say something about being human yeah. and, yeah. and yeah. the embodiment of our humanity in that yeah. sense. John, yeah. I don't know how involved you are in, in making set lists, but is, that, like, is there a certain mm. almost liturgy of setting up the set that you're like, we know we're mm. going to begin this way, and we're going to end with, um, you know, people turn around, and we're going to, and like that's yeah. on purpose, or is it is it sort of like we got to play the hit second, we got to do, you know? <laughs> no, I think you're right. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, you're right. I've never thought about it that way, uh, but it is. There's always just kind of like an intro, right? There's a song that's going to like bring people yeah. in, you yeah. know, and then there's then there's some stuff that you know that people know well that they're, they're going to get into and then maybe there's a lull and some silence and some like mm -hmm. contemplative moments and then bringing people back into like this this you know you're right there's always usually a crescendo towards the end of this like corporate moment where it becomes almost more about the crowd yeah you know the fans than it does about us up yeah. here is you know separated so i think you're right that's that's really cool i like that in the same respect jamie when you go to a show are you cognizant of of what is this doing toward you know in my heart like where is where is this pointing me towards like are you are you thinking about that no are you I able mean, to separate yourself from the <laughs> research a little bit yeah right so what's no i'm definitely not there doing cultural liturgical analysis <laughs> i'm i'm there because i want to you know i want to in a way i want to lose myself in the music I, mm -hmm. I, I suppose one thing that's interesting is when you're going to a concert for the most part you're choosing Mm -hmm. to be there probably already mm -hmm. out of a kind of devotion to that band's yeah. art. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. has probably been cultivated because it already resonates with you. I expect there's a bit of a feedback mm -hmm. yeah. loop experience insofar as like, I get attracted to this band because um, how they play, what their sonic environment is, mm -hmm. and then lyrically, it's like, oh, that's, that's going deep. And then I live with them for years, mm -hmm. and it turns out yeah. it's not just that I'm reacting to the band, the band is also forming and shaping me, mm -hmm. and, and wow. the concert then is, it is a, it's a certain kind of communion. Mm -hmm. I, and I, I, don't think, mm -hmm. I don't think it's watering down the term to say that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I and think and so. I, I think it is, a, it's, there's a certain experience of giving oneself over uh, that's, that's part of the art. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one of the, so one of the questions that I had, which leads right into that, is I think it's fairly typical for most of of my peers to have bands that they've listened to for decades. Yeah. Um, mm. And as I talk with students, I have found that that is less and less of a reality. Mm. And so one yeah. one of the things you talk about in on the road quite a bit is, is sort of this search for authenticity. And at least when I was you know, in my f more formative years, like the bands that I listened to were so much a part of my identity. Sure. Like I had all the t-shirts, that's all I wore. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, mm. I remember like, <laughs> this is a, a funny like thing about Delta Spirit. Uh, there was a year that uh, a couple of y'all had the same exact haircut and I, my buddies all got <laughs> that same haircut and it's ridiculously, like it's the most ridiculous haircut. I don't even know what it was called, but all of a sudden two of my friends got this haircut. So we like, we, wow. we tend to like, like do these things uh, like this is, but with Gen Z, I find that it's more playlist heavy, less mm. album heavy. Mm. Um, mm. So I'm, I'm curious, mm. Jamie, in your teaching mm. and thinking about this book, what, how has that search for authenticity changed in our relationship to pop culture? Um, and even within having a social media where my students talk about branding themselves now. 
Um, mm -hmm. how, how has that shifted in your understanding with this yeah, generation? That's, I, I'm, I, I don't have a great answer to the question because it's a really good question. I haven't thought about it in those terms before, but I think, uh, yeah, I love what you're saying. By the way, in ninth grade, <laughs> you're going to totally judge me for this. But in ninth grade, I remember getting a perm because I wanted to look like John Taylor from Duran Duran. Oh, my god! It went gosh. badly, very, very yeah. badly. But no, I think, um, I think part of what is a little bit heartbreaking to watch is I do think that quest for authenticity is just kind of built into who yeah. we are now. But mm. I think now the sense of authenticity is so conditioned by the response I'm getting from others mm -hmm. that now all of a sudden who I think I am is way too pegged to the veritable market research of how many likes I'm getting on Instagram. And yeah. so what that means is what I want to be is loved. Mm -hmm. I want to be loved. So, yeah. but now what happens is I start tacking the wind. I, I start tacking to the winds of what will get that liking, mm -hmm. and I maybe am not cultivating a center for myself. Whereas mm -hmm. I would say, you know, I'm fifty years old, and and uh, there it is true that in a sense, if like if the boss, if Bruce Springsteen <laughs> was somebody that you sort of resonated with, mm -hmm. it was both because he sort of put into words who you were trying to become, but also right. because he was like um, shaping you. And if you were, in a way, you were apprenticing yourself to the boss. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. I think to have that kind of long-term relationship to art yeah. is a lost art, sadly. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. And you see, yeah, you see less bands that are sticking around for that long. I mean, yeah, Bruce true. has put out his record a few weeks ago and he, uh, I watched the doc on Apple TV with him and, and it was like 51 years of him putting out music like publicly, um, which is yeah, crazy. It's, amazing. Um, it's also a little bit, I don't, I don't know how you guys think about it, but the album is also a bit of a lost concept. Mm -hmm. I mean, when somebody comes out with a really yeah. coherent album, mm -hmm. that is, I think, just a beautiful kind of countercultural hmm. move that yeah. is and I think it's still happening but it's it's yeah. um, the stratification by by song rather than album I think makes a difference yeah. for how we resonate with our I don't know if you guys have that experience yeah yeah I mean there was a moment like you know a few years back where people are kind of saying there's no reason to make albums anymore just make singles like that's that's the appetite you know that people have and and so yeah, we're a bit you know, we're kind of old heads too. So we just have stuck with what, <laughs> with what we know, and and I and I and I like that idea that it's counterculture. We released our first cassette this time, which is like That's you know, there's funny. Awesome. It's a funny world we live in. Like not only do we want finals, but cassettes. So like, but that is kind of a strange like countercultural thing. Like yeah. I'm not gonna like download one song. I'm gonna get this real thing that's difficult to listen to and listen to the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> and there's something kind of kind of awesome in that. Um, but yeah, I wonder about the same thing. Like, I wonder if I had Spotify when I was a kid and could listen to any song in the world, how would that be different than if than what I used to do? Like going to a record store and like, you know, prying through bins and like getting so excited when I found something and like taking it home and listening to it. It's just a it's a whole different way of approaching music. And uh, it's yeah, I don't know. I don't know how it's shifted. I don't know how I would have been formed. Um, yeah. By the current. I've never thought of culture. the cassette. The cassette as its own discipline of listening, hmm. right? Yeah. Like it does, it just forces you to listen to music in a different way. So it's, yeah. it's like yeah. a tactile um, discipline in that sense. That's fascinating. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. You I can't thought, even I drop thought, the pen, right, on the song yeah. you like. You just, <laughs> yeah. I thought when you looked at me, you were going to explain what a cassette was. I'm like, I'm not that. <laughs> I it's, will tell it's you. Like, it's like a CD, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> Where to begin? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I I have not gotten into cassettes again because that was when I was young. That was what we listened to, and it was a terrible listening experience. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, why would uh, peers of mine that are putting out new records will often put them out on cassette? Like, there's this subculture of cassette listeners, and I'm always like, who is buying these? Um, yeah, but yeah, I think it's it's an interesting like it is that analog experience yeah. of I can't skip. Yes. Skip ahead. Yeah. I have to listen to the full yeah. story. 
Um, but also you can take it in a car. Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> Musical asceticism. Yeah, yeah that's done. very good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, John, I want to ask a little bit more. So when, when I typically interview artists on here uh, or, or in the auditorium after a show, I, I usually just sit down with the lead singer and often we end up talking about the lyrics whether we want to or not um, or somebody in the audience will ask about the lyrics um, and very rarely do I get to sit down outside of just friends and talk about what it, what is the music doing that the lyric can't do um, and I know right. this is also sort of what you're studying this semester mm -hmm. and so I'm curious from a bassist perspective um, what are you doing in the band, or what are, what are the rest of the you know non lyric writing members of the band doing that maybe the words can't do or can't say on their own? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, first, I, I mean, I'm thankful to be in a band where Matt, Matt, who's the singer, and Kelly, who sings some, he actually sings two songs on the new album for the first time. Um, but he's written a lot of the songs on other albums. But both of them are really good lyricists. So like, I feel like thankful to be in a band where I can identify with the lyrics and like be proud of them. So, um, but I have thought a lot about like, you know, yeah, being a bass player is, is a funny thing. And, and I think in some ways, I think it might connect to some of the themes, James, that you've written about. Like I've, I've been thinking about the bass recently. It's, it's almost like, a, like a sign of, of like our need for others. Like yeah. the bass does not, you know, there's some people that can like make a bass sing, right? They can <laughs> just, but I am not that guy. I like learned how to play punk bass when I was a kid. And I, you know, I just, I've always been a guy who plays in a band with other people. So mm -hmm. like what I do, my identity is not really bass player. It's person in band, right? So it points to something that's bigger than what I can offer on my own. And, and so, and so, yeah, I think there's, that's one of the things <laughs> that I think a lot about that like I'm all you know being a bass player I'm a part of the action when we bring it live it wouldn't sound right without me but it's definitely not like me who I'm offering to people right mm -hmm. it's yeah. something else so yeah yeah I think that's no that's very powerful that there's a there's an inherently communal mm -hmm. dynamic to the kind of creativity that you're doing and the bass is yeah the bass is also I mean is it fair? I, I don't know enough about this, but sometimes it feels like the bass is, does a work of mourning in some music mm -hmm. that you couldn't do otherwise, right? Like there's a kind of yeah. minor prophet sort of note <laughs> to the bass. It's a bit like yeah. ch cello does yeah. this in some bands mm -hmm. too. Um, yeah. Uh, but there's, I, I find like its distinct capacity within a bigger melodic. Mm -hmm experience is distinctive though right yeah yeah no you're right yeah there is that low frequency that kind of has a guttural yes like essence right that kind yes. of does something to our our physicality to like our emotions in a deep level so yeah yeah, yeah i think you're right yeah. when you guys are when you guys are are like creating new music when you're writing mm -hmm. um does the bass always come in responsively like you like somebody is laying down either lyric or other kind of melody and then you sort of intuit what the bass is does the bass ever lead uh it, it kind of can yeah there's there's well yeah there's one song on, on our last album into the wide that had almost kind of like bass leads going the whole time and then in you know we've had our few moments where i get to kind of <laughs> take lead guitarish kind of place um but uh and you know the drummer of Delta Spirit and I have been playing with each other for like 20 yeah. years now, yeah. and so we just there is that kind of connection. So sometimes mm -hmm. in writing songs, it'll just be he and I like messing around with something, and then other things, other pieces will start getting layered on, and it becomes a song, you know. Or uh, you know, or it can be a, a few chords some guy has on an acoustic, and then then we come in and try to do it together. So it kind of takes each song has kind of taken its own form in different ways there's not like a way we do it but it can yeah it can start with yeah usually bass and drums not usually just bass but yeah. uh yeah i mean there's that great there's that great like blur song right that starts with bass yeah. and like <laughs> that's the song like <laughs> that that bass riff that's the point so yeah, yeah. Hmm. so they did it Maybe it makes it sense to me by the way that there's there's this resonance between percussion and bass mm -hmm. right like there's mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. and and they are they do feel like the most physical yep 
piece yeah. of yeah. the I mean, sonic my, environment. I mean, my wife will go to shows with me, and she will wear earplugs so it's not too loud, but she wants to stand right next to the speakers because she wants to, yeah. she feel, wants it. to feel it. Yeah. Um, she's like, I know a band is good when I can feel the bass in my chest, yeah. like, and it's like, yeah. and it, you know, draws me into the experience. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, yeah, so that's one of those things that you can't, Recreate unless you have like a really nice subwoofer set in your car, like that's not recreatable outside of right the venue, right? In some yeah. ways, yeah. yeah. And some it reminds me just like you know in reading some different stuff you've written, but like the, our cultural emphasis on autonomy, right? Of like being our own person versus dependence, like a kind yeah. of like Rowan Williams calls it non-disabling dependence, right? Like so a de- the dependence can be problematic when it's when it's you know. Uh, when it keeps you from flourishing or something, but recognizing our need for one another uh, yeah. is 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 a sen- like key to I think like a, a Christian vision of, of of who a person is. Right. That's great. Yeah, I mean, it's like the the basis is this icon of creaturehood, which is just <laughs> yeah. grace dependence. Do you know mm. what I mean? Like, there's there's no way you can actually be a flourishing creature without depending both yeah. on God and on the people around you. And to do that well, right. though is quite a dance uh yeah i love that Hmm. yeah Mm. um jamie thinking about the research you're doing now and sort of this conversation um what do you think is happening within the the, these worlds of sort of theology and and music listening and maybe thinking about our students and, and gen z and as they listen to singles and not albums um, what's what's happening within that conversation that you're excited about or mournful of the as we are shaped and affected by pop music that we're listening to and things? Hmm. Oh, that's an interesting question. I mean, I I I um, I still wish we had more attention to form hmm. in music and and less fixation on lyric or maybe maybe that's just the nature of the beast when you want to talk about music mm-hmm. is you talk about the parts that you can talk about yep. which are the lyrics yeah. and, and mm. obviously the lyrics are the poetry of the experience and so uh, um, I, I think it's I, I love it that music is so uh, for some of us I think music is just like you can't imagine going throughout a day mm-hmm. without that sort of pulse of a life it's like it's funny my, my wife she'll, and she would say this if she was here like if she was just in the house by herself all day there would never ever be music that played the whole day hmm. and now since she put it on she's like oh yeah this is great but it's whereas I, I can't imagine being in the house for an hour and not turning on music yeah. <laughs> so but it's interesting um I think I have I've gravitated more towards uh, music that is sort of sonically interesting to me, mm. and not just lyrically. Uh, mm. So I think I think especially those of us who are maybe in theology conversations and stuff, we are also particularly drawn to lyric because it says things that intrigue us. And I again I don't yeah. want to underscore that, but like I I've, I've been surprised at how interested I've become in more sort of electronic stuff lately because mm. I feel mm. like there's a certain cadence of soul uh, that's going on in some of that music that I find really uh, interesting. Mm. So I, I I'm not the most articulate about this, but I think uh, I would love it if the next generation of conversation was became as adept at talking about the form of music and not just mm. the content of music. Yeah. I, I would say that about art in general mm-hmm. and literature too, cool. but yeah. Yeah. Um, same, Is it, sorry, same question for I, you, John. Yeah, oh, sure. Um, I, I was just, it made me think. There's this amazing interview um, between, I, I guess Bjork is the interviewer. So Bjork is interviewing Arvo Parrott and talking about his music and and she you know she's talking about well sometimes there's there are you know there are lyrics there but she's really talking about like his style of composing right like the way he's making music so she's talking about the form and she starts talking about it and and saying like in your music i feel like there's two things happening there's this one thing that's kind of uh all over the place and like do you know going up and down and and then there's this other constant that's just moving through and and bringing that like thing back together and he gets 
so happy. Um, and he's like, yes, you've, 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 this is it. This That's is what I'm awesome. doing. And, but what he says is kind of like, is so beautiful and theologically it says like, he says the first part is me. It's my sins. Wow. <laughs> it's like it's, it's yeah. And then he says the other part is God's love coming through. <laughs> it's wow. just like, whoa, you know, but, but she, so he's intending this, like somehow he's meaning to make music that, that tells the story of salvation. Um, and she, there's no lyrics explaining this, you know, there's no, like, there's yeah. no, no dynamic, but she was able to kind of, to kind of learn it, to learn what he was trying to offer um, just by giving it, you know, the, mm. his music a real lesson, which is pretty amazing. That is awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. what, and it's so great to hear basically a contemporary uh, project that is exactly the same as Handel. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Who's yeah. trying to do the same yeah. thing musically, mm -hmm. even without yeah. words. I think that's really, yeah. really powerful. We, we, yeah. we should say too, sorry, we should say that, um, uh, I mean, your body knows these things about music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The question is yeah. whether we just have the yeah. lexicon to talk about mm. it. And I don't think that we should feel bad if we don't have the lexicon to talk about it. Mm. If our if mm. our body is sort of understanding something of the music mm. on that other register. Yeah. I think it's fun. Yeah. This is why I think criticism makes art appreciation better. Because when I read really good criticism, like, well, in a way, Bjork's question in that mm -hmm. instance is a little act of criticism and then somebody yeah. goes yeah that that's <laughs> it right yeah. i mean i that's that's the that's the beautiful partnership i think between good criticism and and good art and right. so yeah. i I, ho I hope young people would be encouraged to say you don't have to talk about the music that moves you to have permission to love it right that yeah. it's yeah. your body knows mm -hmm. something that's going on there yeah mm -hmm. Well, that is an awesome note to end on. <laughs> Thank you both for being here. This is a great pleasure. to chat with you, John. Thanks so much for yeah, making time. It's, been great. it's great fun. Yeah. For those at home who are Enjoy. wondering where to hear more, you can get on the road or any of Jamie's books at the Kelvin Library or your local bookstore. Sure. And what is there is available wherever you stream or buy cassettes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks a lot, right, guys. Cool.